So, Edward Slingland, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, pleasure. So, for those of you, of those of the audience who don't know who you are, can you maybe just introduce yourself and tell them a bit about the work that you do? Yeah. So, I'm a professor at the University of British Columbia in the Asian Studies Department, but my background is really in religious studies, philosophy, comparative philosophy. So I work on early Chinese thought, so pre-Buddhist Chinese thought, and particularly interested in Confucianism and what's called Taoism, right? It's a later term applied to these early thinkers like Zhuangzi and Lao Tzu. Um, and more recently, last 15 years or so, I've been involved in uh, science humanities integration. So using knowledge from the sciences to help us do our work as humanities scholars better and help us understand the things, the texts that we study better. So that resulted in this uh, recent trade book called Trying Not to Try about where I'm integrating uh, views of early Chinese thinkers on this idea of wu-wei, you know, about effortless action, right? And the tension involved in trying to become effortless. How do you try to be spontaneous? walking people through the various uh, early Chinese solutions, supposedly, to this problem. None of them actually sticks because it is a real paradox. There's no, uh, there's no solution to it. And then talking about from a modern psychological, social, uh, psychological, cognitive, scientific perspective, why the paradox of trying to try is a real paradox. So it falls out of the structure of our mind uh, we're, when we're trying not to try we're the part of the brain that's being activated is the part where you actually need to shut down so it's directly paradoxical um, but then also how each of these four strategies has something to recommend it <clears throat> and each of these four strategies identifies identifies accurately barriers to spontaneity or barriers to being authentic that um, are real problems and that the, the solutions, the strategies that they propose could be useful um, for certain people in certain situations who are trying to get into a state of spontaneity. Mm. That's how I found you through trying not to try in my research for Wu Wei. And what right. I really appreciate about your work is bringing these ancient ideas and, and looking at them, evaluating them with neuroscience with psychology and showing that they still have value to provide to our modern complex lives and you do it without mm -hmm. any of the woo-woo you do it with and um, with an appropriate sense of, of awe and wonder given the subject matter um, so yeah i've really thoroughly enjoyed your work and i'm really grateful for you taking the time to speak to me mm -hmm. so today we're going to talk about Zhongzi. and the reason i contacted you is because in trying not to try you, you mentioned that Chong's is one of your favorite, if not your favorite piece of philosophy. Um, so, yes, yeah, a bit of an exploration together to try and understand Chong's thought. And maybe we could just start a bit about the man himself, if, if we know uh, we have a book named the Chong's, um, but beyond that, the details are, are, are a bit limited. So I was wondering, who is this man that we call Chong's? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> we don't know. We really know nothing about him. Um, he, I think, so the scholarly opinion is that it's possible he was a real person, real historical figure. The text that we have that's called the Zhuangzi is a bit of a mess. So it's got a lot of different layers in it. It's got a lot of different types of content in it. We know that the received version, the version that we have today, was edited by a person named Guo Xiang, who in his preface says um, that he, he inherited a, sort of the current version has 33 chapters. Guo Xiang inherited a version that had many more chapters that he didn't like or thought were repetitive or not interesting and he threw them out. <laughs> so there's, it's the, the received version that we have is a mess already and it was even more uh, diverse when it, before it was edited. So that's part of the problem in trying to figure out who the author was is because the text itself is very messy. But I think that uh, the, you know, the standard division of the book is into inner, outer, and miscellaneous chapters. Those are categories that Guo Xiang put on the text. 
And I think it's not implausible that the, the so-called inner chapters, so the first seven chapters, were written by one person. They were really distinctive writing style. It's like nothing, the classical Chinese is really different. Um, it's one of the most difficult texts to read in classical Chinese in the, in the uh, pre-Chin period, partly because of the authors making up words. The, <clears throat> the Chinese language as he inherited it is just not sufficient. And so he's inventing adjectives and adverbs. Um, it's commentators debate how to understand these terms. It's uh, the way I try to describe it. I, I think I'd say this and try not to try. It's a bit when you read the Zhuangzi after reading the rest of early warring states Chinese thought, it's kind of like listening to um, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band after hearing just like the Beatles poppy stuff in the 60s, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, there's sitars and they're interrupting the songs and there's things like the shifting tempos and um, you really get the feeling that somebody just started, someone just discovered LSD, right? <laughs> this is what happened in between. And that's what you feel like reading the Zhuangzi because it's the pre-Chin materials pretty stayed, pretty much grounded in everyday life. And then suddenly in the Zhuangzi, you've got talking animals and these big fish transforming into huge birds and uh, discussions of death and afterlife. And it's just, it's something completely different. And it really, the, the inner chapters do seem to bear the stylistic imprint of a single person. So if you want to call that person, we might as well call that person Zhuangzi. There's no way we would ever actually know. But I do feel like there was a person who wrote at least the inner chapters and maybe had influence on some of the outer and miscellaneous chapters. So when I talk about, in my class, when I teach this material, when we're talking about Zhuangzi, we're talking about this author, so basically whoever was behind the inner chapters and some of the outer miscellaneous chapters. So that's really all we can, that's all we can say. There, there's some legendary stories about this person. There's stories in the text about him. Uh, I think one thing we can, some things we can glean from the text is that this person probably was trained as a Moist logician. So they seem to be, and this is a relatively new discovery that the um, inner chapters author probably is using these uh, certain terms in a technical logical sense. And it's the suggests that they were trained in this material. So they may have been a trained, basically a trained philosopher. Uh, one of the other bits of personal information in the text we have is that this person's friends with Hui Shi, who was a famous logician, Hui Zi. And that's plausible too. So, I mean, I think the, what I, my gut feeling about this person is they were uh, trained as a logician, possibly uh, this person trained with Hui Zi, but became disaffected with that approach, realized that that approach was not actually doing what it was supposed to do. And, and that led them off into this other, um, this other way. So, so you can get little bits of, what this person, what their training must have been like, clearly a member of the educated elite. But beyond that, it's really hard to say. Mm. Certainly the, the literary prowess is a real pleasure. He explores quite deep topics, but with humor and lightness and talking trees and benevolent bandits that uh, yeah, I yeah, haven't yeah, found yeah. in another philosopher before, which is just so, so much fun. Uh, so maybe talk, so it's a piece of, of, of literary art and, and as well as philosophy. And Burton Watson, he, he says that Zhuangzi's philosophy could be thought of as one of freedom. Is that a, a notion that you would agree with? And if so, what, what do you think Burton Watson means by that? Yeah, um, I, have, I have a whole uh, lecture in my online uh, course on early Chinese philosophy where I argue against Burton Watson's <laughs> interpretation, essentially. Um, so it depends on how, what you mean by freedom. So this is a standard way to approach the Zhuangzi. One of the problems, so one of the problems with accessing the Zhuangzi as a non-classical Chinese reader is there actually isn't a, there isn't one good English translation. And I'm actually, I was, this was going to be my retirement project, but I've decided my next major academic project is going to be a translation of the Zhuangzi because I don't think there's a good single translation. So Burton Watson is the best for style. He really captures the 
the language of the text and the humor of the text in a way that's going to be really hard to shake. Like it's, <laughs> I'm going to be fighting against Burton Watson every day translating this text because his, his prose is in my head. It really renders some of these adjectives and adverbs in a way that would be hard to improve upon. Uh, but Watson didn't, he was reading the text through Buddhist commentary. So he was actually reading the Zhuangzi in a Japanese edition through the commentary of a Japanese Buddhist scholar. And so Watson just really almost subconsciously inherited a lot of his Buddhist view of the Zhuangzi that I think misreads it in certain respects. And one of those respects is this idea of freedom. So, you know, the, in the Buddhist concept, we're trapped in the cycle of samsara. We need to get freed from it. And therefore, you know, you can see Zhuangzi as a philosopher of liberation. And he does use liberation language. He talks about being freed from things. But I think it's important to see that what Zhuangzi wants you to be free of Unlike in, in Buddhism, you want to be free of everything, right? You want to be free of the entire cycle of samsara. The Zhuangzi just wants you to be free of the human world. So he thinks that the problem with us is that we're trapped in this conventional human world that's defined, defined by language, defined by social expectations and social roles. And that that's crippling to us. It suffocates us. And what we need to do is, is liberate ourselves from that world. But once we do that, it's not that anything goes or we're completely outside of the world and free in some ontological, metaphysical sense. What, what freeing ourselves from the human allows us to do is submit to the heavenly. So there's a kind, it's a weird combination where Becoming free, the only way to become free from the human world for him is to give yourself up to the inevitability of the Tao, of the way. And so the Zhuangzi and Sage is not free from heaven. In fact, they're, what makes them free from the human is subjecting themselves to the heavenly and to the restraints of the heavenly. Um, and so when you look at these skill stories like the butcher, woodcarver, um, so Woodcarver Ching or, or Butcher Ding, they're, they're not just freestyling, right? What, what their skill is, is being able to free their minds from preconceptions and from language. And that allows them to actually see the world the way it really is. They see in the text, the way the text puts it is the heavenly pattern. They see the heavenly pattern of the wood or the heavenly pot pattern of the ox, and that allows them to then conform to that heavenly pattern. So when Woodcarver Ching is creating this beautiful bell stand, he has he has a real feeling, his his phenomenological, his kind of inside psychological feeling about it is that he's just freeing this bell stand that's in the wood already. And it's interesting, Michelangelo talked about sculpture that way as well. A lot of artists talk about their work that way, that th what they're doing is really just allowing the material they're working in to express itself and release the heavenly pattern that's in there. And so it's a freedom, freedom from the human, yes, um, but, but part of being free from the human involves submitting yourself to the demands of nature, heaven, however you want to think of it. So it's complicated. It's not just sheer freedom. It's um, in Zhuang, and even in the human there are passages in the inner chapters that suggest that part of being free involves accepting your social situation as well. This is one of the tricky things about the Zhuangzi text. Um, so the, if you think about like Lao Tzu or the Tao Te Ching, that's in a way that's more about freedom in the sense that they want you to really renounce the way you live in the world as a civilized human being. They want you to drop out and go live in a small agricultural village. So really kind of radical transformation of your life. Um, you don't see that in the Zhuangzi. So all of his exemplars are actually involved in Confucian culture, essentially. Um, that's often obscured. It's obscured a bit in Watson's translation that um, Butcher Ding is not just a, he's not a cook. He's not like the Lord one way is not wandering into his kitchen. 
it's butcher ding probably cutting up an ox in this big public confucian ceremony to that where you use the blood of the ox to consecrate a new bell um, that's why the lord is there because it's actually at a big public ceremony so so butcher ding is involved in doing confucian ritual uh, Woodcarver Ching is not carving like a cute little bell stand that he's going to sell at some farmer's market, you know, in this cute rural town. He's building, he's carving one of these stands for for these huge Confucian bells that were used in court music. Um, so the, and there are other people who are basically politicians, or there's even a, a Zhuangzian tax collector in one of the outer chapters. Um so these people are all involved in society and in a way they're accepting their role in society. They're just not getting trapped by it. So it's a tricky, it's liberation, but it's liber it's a kind of internal liber is li you're, you're freeing yourself on the inside, but you're still aware of the constraints that having a body and being a human impose on you. So it, it's a complicated view. And I think it's a little bit more subtle than the the what I call the primitivist movement, which I think the Tao Te Ching, the Lao Tzu text is part of, is this primitive, let's reject society and go live in these small communities. The Zhuangzi is about transforming your relationship to society, not not rejecting it. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I like the way you talked about Zhuangzi explores the weeds of society and you have everyday sages uh, and we can learn from the everyday man not just Confucius and Lao Tzu and, and, and these great people um, yeah yeah great. yeah and trying to and trying to and also celebrating I mean part of the one of the odd features of the text is there are lepers and people who have lost legs and um, hunchbacks and just like this and I think what he's trying to do is show you that um, you don't know where wisdom is, right? You don't necessarily, it's not necessarily in the person who looks like the big fancy Confucian sage. Um, and that's, that's part of the appeal of the book as well as it's um, examining the, trying to find wisdom in these everyday moments rather than in these fancy Confucian texts or rituals. Mm. It'd be interesting to hear a bit about the context of that world. I mean, maybe uh, a short summary of, of maybe the warring states and then Confucianism against which Zhuangzi seemed to be writing. He talks a lot about kind of the constraints that the dominant Confucian approach may put on people. So I don't know if you could speak a bit about that. Yeah, so the warring states is this period where China is divided between these various states that are all vying for dominance so this is roughly 600, uh, 500 BC down to 221 when one of these states, the Qin state, which is why we call China, China, uh, finally unifies China under imperial rule. So this is the period right before the unification of China. And it was an interesting period because everything was in flux. There was new technologies, literacy was expanding, and yet it wasn't clear what civilization was going to look like. The older feudal system had broken down. Um, there were new models of social organization. There, was, um, there were a lot of new ideas about how to organize society floating around. And so that's why it was an exciting, exciting period. It's in Chinese, sometimes called the period of the hundred schools because there were all these philosophical schools vying with one another. And one of the big schools was that we can loosely call Confucianism, believe that the answer to this confusion and chaos and fighting was for people to accept this traditional culture that came down from the Western Zhou dynasty that involved rich, various ritual practices um, that really encompassed everything from big state rituals like the, the, the bell um, consecration ceremony down to the way you dress and the way you sat and the way you spoke. So pretty all-encompassing model of behavioral guidelines, if you want to think of them that way, in the form of ritual. And that also thought you needed to shape your mind by studying these ancient texts that, in their view, encompassed, you know, uh, personified the insights of these sage kings, these ancient sage kings. So that's the context in which Zhuangzi's writing is that 
there's this there's one there's a school the Confucians who are saying we need to get back to ancient Zhou culture. <clears throat> there's another rival school called the Moists who believe that tradition can't save us. What we need to do is use our rationality and figure out what's the most beneficial way to be. So this there's this the Moists were essentially they were they were utilitarians. So they believe that you can figure out the right thing to do you can figure out the right thing to do by figuring out what produced the greatest benefits, what sort of behavior produced produce the greatest benefits. And once you logically figure that out, you just could force yourself to behave in that way. And they believe one of the principles that fell out of utilitarian reasoning was what they called impartial caring. So caring for everyone the same way, whether they're your father or someone else's father, you should treat them the same way. So that's another school he was fighting against. Um, an offshoot of that school, I think the the logicians he was grappling with were a type of Moist who believed that you could, once you figured out what the right way to behave was, you could formulate that in very specific teachings, verbal expressions that you could then apply in an objective way in everyday life. So every for every choice you had, you would have a maxim that would tell you the right thing to do. Um, so that's kind of the context. And then he's also got um, in the mix are the primitivists, so the kind of Lao Tzu school people who are saying we have to reject society and go back to living in nature. You had uh, individualist kind of uh, screw the world and worry about yourself people. So the youngest who said, you know, let's just worry about our bodies. You know, all we know is that we have bodies and we have a lifespan. Let's live that lifespan out the best we can and not get involved in politics, not get involved in debates about things. Let's just try to be healthy essentially and live out our lives. So those are the youngest. And you see youngest and primitivist writings in the text, the Zhuangzi. Uh, so it's, that's what's confusing about the text. So you have all these different strands. But I think the, the inner chapters Zhuangzi is opposed to all these people. And his, his basic, I think in a nutshell, what Zhuangzi thinks is that the world is so complicated and it's changing so fast that you can't track it with logical or verbal categories. And you can't track it with ancient ritual guidelines or ancient texts. The only way to actually track the world and respond accurately to it is to make your mind tenuous or empty. So you do this famous idea of fasting of the mind, right? You empty your mind in some way. And you're emptying it of preconceptions, of things that you've learned, of your sense of your own importance or how cool you are or smart you are. When you can do that, the world as it really is will reveal itself to you. The heavenly pattern will reveal itself to you. And then you'll be able to move through the world in a skillful way. And so he... In a way, he's rejecting all the various schools around him for the same reason. And I think he would reject the Tao Te Ching Lao Tzu authors as well, because they're saying this is the right way to live. And he doesn't think we know what the right way to live is. The right way to live is whatever's right in the moment based on your judgment once you've freed yourself from preconceptions and you're you're responding to the world with this, this force he calls the spirit that's inside you instead of using your mind. So that's the context in which he's, he's writing. There's this, um, you know, hundreds of hundred schools all debating each other about what the, the best way to live is. And he thinks that um, thinking that you could figure that out and that then you'd know you'd have like a, a hundred percent fail safe way to act is, is wrong that we don't know. And it's, you see this in the text itself where he's, um, he's constantly undermining things he says, right? He doesn't, he doesn't want to say there's no right and wrong and it's wrong to believe in right and wrong because that would be setting up a right and wrong. So he's constantly saying something and then undermining it. He'll say something and then say, well, is what I just said, does that really say anything or does it say nothing? Um, 
I think his, his strategy for getting around this problem of language is to just present us. The reason there's so many stories in the text is that I think he, he's not going to tell you the right way to live. What he's going to do is show you people living the right way and hope that you will figure out what you need to do to emulate them. Um, so that's his goal is to basically liberate <clears throat> individuals. And so that's, in that sense, it is a kind of philosophy of freedom, but liberate you so that you can actually act the way you're supposed to act, given the real restraints of the world. Mm. Yeah. I love it when he says, yeah, I've said many words in my life, but have I actually said anything? Something to that. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, are the words that I say any different from the chirpings of birds? He says at one point. Um, so he's, and he's doing this deliberately, quite deliberately. He's, he's really worried about getting trapped in a fixed statement or philosophy. So this is what makes him interesting as a philosopher and so uh, difficult to pin down. Hmm. Um, I, I like the way in Try Not To Try you talk about Confucius as, I think by memory, an uptight grandfather. Could you speak a little bit on, on that? Yeah, there's it's a, there's different there's different Confucius's. So um, there's the kind of caricature Confucius who is this uptight grandfather. He's this stiff ceremonialist. He only wants to do certain things certain ways, the way the Zhou Dynasty did it. He gets really up, upset if people depart from traditional behavior in any way. Um, and that that Confucius does pop up in the text and get criticized. Um, so there are people who have characterized Zhuangzi as a kind of Confucian, as like a really liberal wing of the Confucian school. Um, and I don't think it's a completely crazy way to look at him because there are, if you read the Analects of Confucius, there's another Confucius there. Um, the Confucius, there's the Confucius there that people don't always know about is the Confucius who is about flexibility and being sensitive to context and knowing when it's time to modify things or change things. Um, so it's Confucius in the, in the Zhuangzi is a very complex figure. So sometimes Zhuangzi uses Confucius as his mouthpiece to express his own views, right? So sometimes Confucius is really just giving, telling us what Zhuangzi thinks is the case. Um, there are times when he is appearing as the kind of uptight ritualist who needs to loosen up a little bit. Um, there are also times when he appears as a really kind of almost noble, tragic figure. So there's a, there's a passage, I think it's is it the one, I think it's the same one with a funeral. So um, there's a great, whoever wrote the, Whoever wrote the Zhuangzi, so this person we'll call Zhuangzi, also was very familiar with Confucianism. They had certainly had read the Analects of Confucius. They know the different disciples and they know their personality types. Um, so there's a great passage where uh, Confucius, one of uh, these, there's a group of Taoist sages and one of them dies. And so Confucius sends his disciple Zugong to go pay his respects. And Zugong is a great choice because in the Analects itself, Zugong is like the uptight disciple. Zugong is the one who knows how to do ritual. He's really good at it, but he sometimes isn't as flexible as he could be. Um, at one point, Confucius calls him a vessel. He calls him a chi, um, which is a kind of ritual vessel, which seems to suggest that he's got, he's very good at doing this narrow thing, but he lacks this kind of flexibility. Um, so Zugong shows up and the, the three friends who are left are getting drunk and banging on tubs and singing. They're certainly not doing proper Confucian ritual. Um, and Zugong freaks out and, is, and runs back to Confucius and says, I don't know who these people are. And Confucius says, oh, I shouldn't have sent you. So he realizes that Zugong was the wrong person to send because he's so rigid. And then he says something to the extent of, these are people who live beyond the bounds of the human. Um, you and I, Zogong, we're stuck here in this world. Um, they wander in this world beyond us. And, and then he says something like, but it's, you know, it's our kind of fate to be here in this world and we have to do what we're doing. And so he's, it's Confucius in a couple of these passages seems to acknowledge that the Zhuangzian sages are liberated from the human world in a way that he is not. 
but also seems to be saying, well, it's my fate. Heaven kind of fated me to live in the human world. And so that's what I'm doing. And in that way, he's kind of a noble figure. Like he actually realizes his limitations and accepts them. Um, so he's he, the, the person of Confucius is complicated in the Zhuangzi. And I think one of the signs of some of these chapters that aren't from the inner chapters author are the ones that kind of crudely make fun of Confucius. So there are chapters where he's made fun of and presented as a kind of idiot. Um, and I don't think those are the products of this inner chapters author. They had a much more complicated view of Confucius. Mm. So. Certainly complexity that is a common theme. You know, he doesn't just have a, a broad brush of any sort of character. He appreciates the nuance in each position. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Cool. So it's good to get, understand some context of, of uh, the period in which Zhuangzi was writing in and the sort of other ideas that were prominent in his time. And one of the things I enjoy the most about the text is his ability uh, to just ridicule using humor uh, and parable and uh, hilarious characters to try and challenge the certainty that I have or we have on concepts like right, wrong, good, evil, useful, usefulness, life, death. Um, he brings a, a whole lot of nuance and humor to those sort of concepts. He, he allocates a lot of stories to exploring those sort of judgments and concepts. What do you think uh, Zhuangzi had? What, what was his problem with judgments uh, and these sort of, the certainty we, certainty we have around these concepts? His main, he thinks the main flaw of human beings is our tendency to use our mind to make right and wrong distinctions. He describes this as the essence of being human. So his view of human beings is kind of complicated. We have this uh, heavenly spirit inside of us that we can get in touch with if we can down-regulate our mind and allow our spirit to take over. But it's our nature to not do that. It's our nature to want to follow our mind and make our mind the ruler. And so one way to look at what he's trying to do is dethrone the mind as the controller of our behavior. He wants us to tap into something that he sees as deeper. Um, and so the problem is we use our mind, and the, one of the functions of the mind is to cut up the world into clear categories, in his view. That's what the mind's for, in a way. And so the, the mind chunks up the world into categories and puts labels on them. And then we're supposed to use those categories to, to navigate our behavior in the world. And he thinks the problem with that is, again, that, that the world is too complex. The world is changing all the time. I think, you know, the one slight debate about how to understand the story that opens the Zhuangzi, the story of this big whale-type creature that turns into a bird and flies south turns into the pung bird um i think one one theme that's being expressed there is this idea in chinese classical chinese hua uh transformation is probably the best way to do it uh but things are constantly transforming into other things and so categories aren't stable and so we can't navigate the world using fixed categories and so what he wants you to do, what he thinks the Taoist sage does is he, the metaphor he uses sometimes is making your mind like a mirror. So you, your mind is just going to reflect what's in front of it. And categories and ideas of right and wrong and teachings from the past, these are all things that obscure your mirror, that make it so that your mirror is dirty and it's not actually reflecting what's in front of it. So if you can clear fast your mind, clear away these, these categories and these concepts, what you'll be left with is this empty or tenuous mirror that can actually really reflect what's in front of it. And it doesn't mean not making, this is something people also sometimes get a little bit wrong about the Zhuangzi, I think, is it's not about not making distinctions at all. Because to live in the world, you have to choose left versus right. You got to choose which way you're going to go. When Butcher Ding or the woodcarver are doing their thing, they're making choices all the time. I'm going to cut here and not here. Um, the difference is that if your mind is empty, you see what's really in front of you, and then you make the decision based on what's in front of you, 
not what you think is in front of you. You're actually making it in real response to reality instead of to reality overlaid by all these categories that's obscuring your view of what's in front of you. And so that's his main, his main worry about rigid right and wrong is that it's obscuring our view of the world. Um, and you see this so as, you know, in the social world. So you're not interacting with people the right way because you have certain preconceptions about who they are or what they are based on what they look like. Or, I mean, that's why he, um, I think he celebrates these people who are, uh, you know, have one leg or they're hunchback or they're a leper or they're a butcher. So, I mean, it's, I think it's hard for us to realize how radical it is for him to use a butcher as a spiritual exemplar because butchers were the lowest of the low in Confucian society. Um, it was a kind of almost kind of outcast profession because you were taking life. You, your job was to kill things. And um, so butchers were really kind of viewed with suspicion. Um, and, and yet in chapter three of the Zhuangzi, we have this butcher who's a spiritual exemplar and who's showing us how to, who's teaching this Lord how to live his life. So I think that's part of the idea too, is you, you know, you need to suspend your, your stereotypes and your preconceptions about who people are and actually interact with them as they really are. And that's the way to, um, that's the way to move through both the physical and the social world skillfully. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. And I think that for me, that's his ability to just very clearly illustrate the, the, the limitations of these concepts and right or wrong and, and life and death in particular for me in, in my current mm. thing, has just been, you know, just amazing. Another sort of set of constructs that he talks about are, are desires and, and mm -hmm. uh, tendency, it seems, that you saw around him, people desiring to consume more or do more, you know, be more intellectual, be more successful. And that was at the, the cost of uh, happiness or, or freedom. He uses the story of the caged pheasant, where the pheasant would happily go 100 steps to get some water uh, rather than be pampered in a cage. Um, so yeah. why, what, what do you think Zhongzi thought the problem with following desire was? Well, it's, it's a similar problem. So it's, you, it's desire based on rigid ideas of what's success and what's not success. So um, you decide that having, being successful means having this type of job and this type of house and this type of car. And you, his, there's a beautiful passage um, in chapter two where he talks about great learning versus petty learning, or, or great, sorry, great knowledge versus petty knowledge. And it seems to describe people who are on this treadmill where they're constantly pursuing more stuff because they have a rigid idea of what success involves. And in fact, they're making themselves miserable. So they are wearing their bodies out, they're wearing their spirits out, they never, they never stop. They're always moving. They're never quite happy. And the, his diagnosis of that problem is it's essentially the same diagnosis he has with regard to moral certainty. Um, you don't want to be certain that you're right and other people are wrong. You also don't want to be attached to a particular model of success especially if it's one that's given to you by your society. So he thinks society gives us these notions of what it means to be successful. And they're often wrong. Um, so um, you don't want to turn yourself into this caged pheasant or the, you know, the famous story about um, Zhuangzi being offered a job and the, the imperial, the, court of a ruler right so that's success being a that's what all these philosophers wanted essentially was to be at a court of a ruler and have this kind of basically tenured track have a tenured job <laughs> at a university um, that was success um, and so someone comes and offers Zhuangzi he's fishing on this river and offers him this job and he says um, I hear there's this great sacred turtle and this this court to this ruler who's kept in a fancy box and he's worshipped and the guy says yeah that's true and he says um, do you think that turtle would rather be there 
being worshipped in, in this fancy box, or would he rather be here dragging his tail in the mud on the side of the river? And the guy says, well, he'd probably be, drag- be dragging his tail in the mud. And so Zhuang Zi says, well, then let me drag my tail in the mud. Go away. And I don't want to be trapped in this thing that is going to kill me and that people think is what I should be aspiring to, but it's not what I aspire to. So it's, it's the identical problem to moral certainty is thinking that you know you know what success is. And when you think you know that, you pursue it and you fail to notice that it's killing you, that it's making you miserable, that it's wearing you out. So he wants, again, that's a type of liberation theme in the Zhuangzi is liberating you from social expectations. And I think that's very much relevant to today's society, just as ancient Chinese society. Given that Zhongzi talked about the, the limits and the, the danger of following desires, what, just with your kind of neuroscientist and psychologist hats on, why is it that human beings seem to have that tendency to keep on desiring and, and never getting there? Yeah, so the, the problem with us is that we habituate. So the same, it's the same feature of why if there's a... Um, background noise in your environment. If you live near the train tracks, you eventually stop hearing the trains, right? So our sensory systems are designed to filter out the stuff we already know and to focus on new things. Um, So if you regularly have trains going by your house, at first you would notice it and then you don't. Your your brain starts saying, let's ignore that that input now because we already know about that. Um, So that's good for humans to navigate the world um the problem with this is we habituate to pleasures too so once you if you've ever been you know in a long hiking camping trip and you get home and you take a hot shower for the first time and you put on clean clothes for the first time and you sit in a comfortable chair for the first time you're like this is awesome (laughs) this is like the best thing that's ever happened to me um but within a couple of days, you just it's just like that's what you do. You sit in a comfortable chair, you're clean, you're used to it. So that that's habituation, um, and that's the main problem people have when it comes to uh, happiness. So this is psychologists sometimes refer to this as the hedonic treadmill. That once you acquire something that you desired, you then desire something new. We, ne- we seem to be, humans seem to be built in such a way that we are never satisfied. And that's a good way to build an organism because you don't want an organism to just sit around and be like, oh, I'm happy now. I'm not going to do anything else. You want organisms to constantly be striving, trying to get more. Um, so from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense. It's just from an individual human happiness perspective, it really it's a problem <laughs> it's why we're always we're never happy we get the the car we think we want and then within a couple months we're habituated to it and we want a fancier car um and and you know marketers so capitalism is built on this um churning of desire right we're always being presented with new things that we now suddenly need and you know, advertisers are very good at tapping into this. So this is why you get convinced you need, you know, the new iPhone when your old iPhone is perfectly fine, but suddenly everyone has this new iPhone and you need that. And so he's, he's diagnosing this. Um, and the Tao Te Ching authors are also worried about this too, the kind of artificial desire that society creates. Um, it's this, uh, we're, we're distracted by shiny objects, right? We're always pursuing these things. And they never satisfy, they, the way we're, we're built in such a way that they, there's no way they could actually satisfy us. Once we get this new pleasure, we habituate to it, and then it's not a pleasure anymore. And so Zhuangzi wants to try to short circuit that, that constant, that hedonic treadmill, the constant pursuing of pleasures by getting us to realize that um, maybe the thing we have now is what we want and we don't need to pursue the next thing. Um, so that's where, I mean, one way to look at it is he's trying to get you to, he's trying to get you to undo your habituation. So he wants to undo social learning where we've gotten these rigid categories about the world. 
But I think he also, to put it in modern psychological terms, I think he wants us to try to fight against habituation. So I'm sitting in this comfortable chair. Um, I'm drinking great Vancouver tap water, which is... When I first moved to Vancouver, I was like, wow, the tap water is delicious because I was coming from L.A. where the tap water is disgusting. Um, but I've habituated to it now. So now I'm just like, it's why does water taste like that? <laughs> um, Zhuangzi would want us to, I, he would, Zhuangzi would want me to, in the moment when I drink the water, appreciate that this is delicious water, like try to recover that pleasure that I had. Um, and I think he thinks if we can do that, we've now freed ourselves from one of the engines that drives unhappiness. It's one of the things that, is constantly driving us to get new things. If we can actually recover our sense of pleasure and just things around us that we already have. Mm. Fascinating. Thank you. I'm going to enjoy this. It's really delicious water. <laughs> I just came from Scotland. So there's, yeah, very good. It's pretty, yeah. Not quite as good. <laughs> yeah. um, so maybe just... It, What's your favorite bit about Zhongzi? I mean, you, you, you talked about um, the fact that it is one of your favorite pieces of philosophy. Why, why has it struck something inside of you where other pieces may not have? I mean, all, all of the early warring states thinkers that I teach and that I read are appealing for various reasons. I think they all have something important to say. I think I, the Zhongzi... It just stands apart because it is so funny. Um, it seems to be the product of of this really brilliant and thoughtful individual who who saw things about the human condition that I think are deeply true, and that it's amazing. You know, you read these um, like this chapter two the the great knowledge versus a small knowledge passage. And it sounds like a critique of modern capitalist society. Like it really, it's amazing the degree to which the, the things he diagnosed seem to be eternal universal human problems. And I think his, his way of um, his proposed solution, he doesn't have a fixed solution, but he's got these various strategies are just obviously useful <laughs> so there you know the confucian stuff is there's um there, there are important insights about why social knowledge is important why rituals are important why learning from the past is important why recognizing the the role of other people in your life is important so uh, the importance of social roles and understanding the duties of being a father and being a son or being a husband or being a child. Um, these realizing these role specific duties is important. Um, but there's a kind of Zhuangzi has got a kind of, um, universal applicability to it. This idea of being empty and open to what's around you has a kind of, um, it's something you can apply in almost any situation and it's good therapy. It's good spiritual intellectual therapy, right? You read the Zhuangzi and you feel a little bit looser and calmer and ready to respond to things better. Um, so there's just something um, invigorating about the text. So it's, it really is the most, I think it's the, if I had one book, it would be the Zhuangzi. And I think it's really the most important, um, both content-wise and style-wise, that I've ever read. Hmm. Have you heard of the British program Desert Island Discs? No. It's on Radio 4, which is you know, very proper British um, media, and celebrities and politicians go on, and they have five uh, tracks or records, um, discs, okay. and a book and an object. So that would be your Desert Island book. Oh, okay, yeah. That would be my Desert Island book, yeah, definitely. <laughs> And if someone wanted to get started in exploring the rich world of Zhongzi, how would you recommend them doing that? Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> is that there's not a real, there's not a single good English translation. Um, and there, I mean, I it's my next project, but it's going to be like 
this is six, seven years out before anyone will be able to read that. Um, Burton, I think this, if you're stuck reading one translation, Burton Watson is still probably the best. He really does capture the, the style and the feel of the text. It's fun to read. He's a really great prose stylist. Um, so I think Burton Watson's um, essential Zhuangzi, so the, he translates the inner chapters and then some of the outer and miscellaneous chapters. That's probably the best introduction to Zhuangzi you can get. Um, there's a chapter on the Zhuangzi in my Try Not to Try book, which relates Zhuangzi and themes to modern psychology, cognitive science. Um, I think that uh, you mentioned in an uh, email that cartoon version of the Zhuangzi, right? Um, and that's recently been translated into English by a colleague of mine, Brian Bruya. Um, and I, I wrote a preface for the next edition of that. So Princeton's putting out a new edition of that. Um, and I read that in Taiwan in the 80s and loved it. Wow. It's, it's, um, it, cap it also does a good job of capturing the spirit of the Zhuangzi. Um, I, st I still think conceptually it gets some things wrong because it's still reading Zhuangzi through this Buddhist lens. But um, it's, it's a beautiful little book. Um, yeah, it's hard to know where to go. A, A, there's a translation of the inner chapters by A.C. Graham, who was a pioneer in Zhuangzi studies, who really got us to see how some of these passages you can't understand unless you understand that Zhuangzi is using certain words in a technical lowest logic sense and it completely transforms the way you understand certain passages so ac graham is great for the philosophy but it's a uh, um it's terrible to read it's really it's a really painful translation to try to read so um it's he gets the philosophy right but he doesn't really capture the style um and it's a slog it's a slog I, i'm not sure i'd recommend that to a general reader um yeah, so there's not really, uh, then, the, you know, there's a couple other, uh, Victor Mare has a translation that gets the literary qualities, but again, not all the philosophy, I think. Um, it's hard to know what to recommend. So I, what I would recommend, I guess, is reading different translations. If you can't read classical Chinese, the best thing to do is triangulate by reading some different English translations and um, getting a sense of how they differ and what some translations capture and what other translations don't. Um, I don't know how else to do it when you're, you're cut off from the original language, right? Yeah. yeah certainly my approach is, is taking as many different translations as I can in order to just as best as I can approximate. Uh, and if people want to find out what you're up to, would you recommend any books or, or ways to connect with you? Uh, yeah, so there's Try Not to Try. There's uh, another resource people could use is I have an online uh, MOOC, one of these massive open online courses on foundations. Great course. I've, I've used it. Um, so thank okay. You. Yeah. yeah, so that um, the, the lecture videos for that are on YouTube. And so you can access. And I have a whole module on Zhuangzi that people can watch. Um, and otherwise, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Um, but I'm right now I'm working on a trade book on intoxication that's on the function of drunkenness and intoxication in human life and human civilization. And it's actually a book that was inspired uh, by Zhuangzi. It's uh, inspired by a, certain, a passage in the Zhuangzi about being drunk on heaven. Um, so it's, uh, it's, yeah, interestingly, the, yeah, my next the trade book I'm writing right now was prompted in some ways by the Zhuangzi. Mm. That's a point that stuck with me from reading Try Not to Try that I've discussed with friends is, is the, the use of alcohol to be a, a, a lubricant in social interactions. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. And found yeah. in all cultures, in many cultures. And puzzling from an evolutionary perspective, given how damaging alcohol is. It's really, it's, it's a poison. It's a neurotoxin, right? It's really, there's a reason our body tries to get it out of our body as quickly as possible. And yet humans still pursue it. And there's a reason for that. So the, this, this, this book is basically a, um, 
an elaboration of some of those themes and trying not to try or why, you know, we have these cooperation dilemmas we need to get past. And um, one technology, cultural technology we've come up with for doing that is, is alcohol and other intoxicants, it's basically downregulate prefrontal cortex. So um, that's the project I'm working on right now. Well, we could talk all day. Uh, it's been a very rich and interesting conversation for me. Thank you for your time. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's fun. Thank you very much.